Hello, multi Molchovskis. Apparently, that's a real world, a real word. <clears throat> and thank you to Ayur Santa. Probably got that wrong. Never mind. I'm show sure goes on. Ayur Santa for the malt mention for Ralphie Review 894 Extras. It's an extras. And as I intimated in my last review featuring this whiskey here in my left, on your right, Brooklady, the organic 2010, an eight year old, 50% volume, unchill filtered, natural coloured, single malt whiskey, uh, grown from barley in Scotland, up in the north, near Inverness, in Cromarty Firth, and distilled, Matured and bottled, and bottled too. Not many distilleries do that. Brooklad is one of them. They have their own dedicated bottling plant, and I commend them for it. Very good thing to do, in my opinion. And uh, I've always kept an eye on this distillery. I've always found it curious, a little bit of an enigma. And curiosity got the better of me when Back in 2004, I was planning my holiday and I thought, do you know, it's too easy to go to other countries and to forget to explore your own country and importantly your own culture. And of course I'd been around whiskey for about 20 years, mid 80s, early mid, mid 80s. I was buying a few bottles, um, going to the local pub, talking to people in the industry, making my first, knock, literally knocking in doors of distilleries for a wee distillery visit, and some guy that just happened to be on his shift would show you around and you'd bung him a tenner at the end of it. That's what you did in those days. Very few distilleries opened their door to, to distillers. Main thing is, when you arrived, always be polite. And they'd be saying, you know, it's usually the Germans who come knocking on the door of the distillery. Um, not, not very, get very few Scottish people taking an interest in Scotch whisky because that's an old man's drink these days. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. It's not so much that things change over time; it's how they change over time. That's what kind of gets me. And I think this has been fueled very much by technology. Technology speeds everything up. It amplifies things. I'm sure you agree. Um, but I decided, right, I'm going to... First I looked at Springbank. Because they had a, a sort of academy. And I thought, um, well, I could go there. But hang about. Someone's recommend. I've got a friend in the whiskey club who's from Isla. Who's talking about... Brochladi's reopening, they're starting from scratch, they've got all the community behind them, they've got this wine geezer who's kind of all passionate about it and they've got the local, um, basically some of the local whiskey worthies involved. So I contacted the distillery, applied to go on the course and paid my thousand pounds to attend the course. It was, I think it was May or June or some, either spring or an autumn, 2004. And, and that was kind of quite a lot of money for a kind of distillery, fancy distillery tour, really. But your meals were provided, some comfortable accommodation was provided, and I suspected that the quality of insight that we were going to get would be second to none. And I have to say, I was not disappointed. Um, there was about one, two, three, four, five, six students. Six students. I was the only Scotsman. Um, I was the first Scotsman to do the uh, Brochlady Whiskey School Academy. And basically, you arrived, they gave you your Brochlady boiler suit, you had a wee chat from Jim McEwen in the shop. And then you went up to your accommodation, you had a cup of tea, um, and basically a few of the guys went to the pub and I went to bed because I was absolutely shattered because I had a really, really busy day just clearing up at work before I'd headed up to get the ferry. And the following day, 
we were all separated the students to go to different areas in the distillery, the still room, the warehouse, the bottling plant, the um, mash, mash house, and we all had these rolling tasks, so in different days we'd be in different places. And I learned a huge amount from that experience. Some of it was scripted, but a lot of it wasn't actually. Um, I, I, I really get a feel that there was an excitement in the air that global interest in whiskey was on the up, up, and that this new distillery which had just opened its doors on a wing and a prayer and a very small budget um, could actually survive and there would be increased demand. Now they really knew how to bang their drum uh, and there was nothing original about it. They basically took what was successful at Springbank, that integrity distillery model, and had kind of had the foresight to just superimpose it onto Brochladi very successfully doing what they did at the right time and making mistakes along the way. I mean, the thousand and one variety whiskies um, were dizzying um, in, in their arrival, then swift departure, but it was exciting. The, the garish branding and the colouring the, and, the, and the tins the um, ag the verbally aggressive promotion and tub thumping, which was so successfully done by Jim McEwen, and I remember attending. You know, when the distillery just opened, he had uh, a a whiskey evening <laughs> at Peckham's Delicatessen in the centre of Glasgow, and I went along, and he'd obviously. He'd had a long day and you could clearly see he was getting a bit frayed at the edges and he was basically, I would describe a temperamental man and I mean that, I don't mean that, dis, you know, I mean that dispassionately. And he says, right folks, right folks, what are you smelling? What are you noticing in this whiskey? And everybody's sitting there going, ooh. He says, I've come a long way to be here. I'm sharing this with you. I want to hear you. And he was going, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Uh, it was quite entertaining, particularly the end when he had everybody up on the seats and the tables six whiskies later for his Highland Toast. Right, I know that few of you watching have experienced that uh, and for the record I would like to just make my perspective. You will never ever see that at a Ralphie tasting because it is quite simply one of the most health and safety hazard moments that you'll ever encounter at a whiskey tasting. It's just an opinion. <laughs> but um, he had everybody chuntering away, doing the Gaelic toast and, every, you know, the clans murdering each other and all the rest of it. Very dramatic. But at that moment in time, people weren't so cynical as they are now. It was new, it was refreshing, it was away from the quiet, almost academic nosing of the glasses and fine notes and subtleties and the, you know, the beauty of these exceptional casts and slumbering in the warehouse as you're gently slumbering off to sleep during your second dram of the tasting session. Uh, it was none of this, you know, Jim really kept you awake. Um, and there was very few distilleries. I mean, Bruchlady stood out for the way it presented itself to the wider world in a way that other distilleries just didn't. Other distilleries were just quiet. That's the only word to describe them. They were quiet, reserved, demure. And times were changing then. Even in the whiskey club, you could sense it. The, the tempo was upping in the journalist, journalism side of things with a few of the members. And um, the, the vlogs hadn't started. Um, the internet was only just, I mean, in 2004, I think I was when YouTube started. The first video went up. Nobody was really online apart from sending emails slowly on dial up. <laughs> At 
tell you what, my first videos in 2009 were loaded on a dial-up modem. Seriously. Really, really basic, low resolution, because the cables couldn't handle anything more. Um, oh, jeez, I'm starting to feel like a veteran now. But I learned so much from John the Cooper, absolute gentleman, and a, a joy, such, he'd, he'd come and he'd stop and he'd chat and he'd be patient with you, and he'd, it was great to have someone dismantle a cast and let you dismantle a cast and show you how it really, really worked. How casks genuinely work. What's a good cask? What's a bad cask? What's the difference? What's in between? How you, you, you can, what you can tell looking at a cask, what you can tell observing a cask, which is more than looking at it. It's getting a sense, what's the smell like? Where are the stains in the cask? Where, where are they? Is there any bashes and marks and gouges and all the rest of it in these casks? How many layers of paint are now on the front paddle head? How many times has it been stenciled? That's when I really started to learn that. And Duncan McGilvery, the manager, um, absolute, the patience of a saint, had us in stacking barrels in the warehouse. I spent a day doing that and by the end of the day I couldn't even, leave, even lift a glass of whiskey because my wrists were hanging off the end, of, my hands were hanging off the end of my wrists. It was such hard physical work. And I tell you what, there's too many people now, there's too many people making decisions in the whiskey industry who have never rolled a barrel in their damn lives and that they should not be allowed to. See, your marketing people spend at least a week, two weeks, three weeks in a distillery, rolling barrels, scrubbing out the wash back with a big broom. I tell you what, you don't need the sauna. You don't need your gym membership. Some damn hard graft in the distillery to understand what goes into the product. Instead of all this wishy-washy, dreary, sanctimonious, wash, rinse, repeat flannel that we get time after time. I'm telling you folks, eventually you just start to yawn at it. And this is why a real tangible connection is, is something so much more substantial. And at the end of the week, I, you know, we had our exam, we all passed our exams. <coughs> we went out to the pub for our final session and the hospitality was fantastic. Everybody took time out, and I think it was the novelty. Who are these people that would pay this money to come to us to find out what we are doing for a job? <laughs> and at that point, I started buying more Brochlady. I bought two barrels of Brochlady. A, a barrel of Port Charlotte, which I've now bottled. It's the meteorite bottling. It's long gone, folks. But there's the other barrel. Um, of standard Brochlady that I bought in 2004, which is now about 17 years old. 17 years old. I mean, the distillery, distillery now is 19 years, almost 20 years since its resurrection. And um, this raises a very interesting question. Because I remember, I, I ignored the dark arts, the black art bottlings, the weapons of mass distinction bottlings, all these yellow submarine, all the novelty stuff, I ignored that. And the increasingly ridiculous prices connected to them. I went for the 12 year old, 15 year old and 17 year old and I believe for a while there's a 21 year old from original stocks and they were fantastic whiskies. I'm telling you. I, I didn't, I, I polished them off so quick I didn't even get around to reviewing them for the channel. Otherwise, they've become a historical archive now. Um, the 12 was great whiskey, 15 even better, and the 17 was absolute nectar. The 17 was a 92 out of 100. 17-year-old Brochlady, bottled at 46%, unchill filtered and natural colour, when, when that was seriously a novelty. It was, you know, highly unusual. And people were wondering, what's chill filtration? Well, what's this chill filtration? What's all that about? 
oh, we use it because someone complained in, in Singapore that they they put ice in their, 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 their goblet in the gentleman's club and it went a little bit cloudy. So we've introduced all these expensive equipment throughout the industry and um, we're chill filtering everything to make it nice for you and clear and sanitised and safe in case you get too much flavour in your dram. Heaven help us, we've got to protect you from that. I'm sorry, I'm sounding sarcastic and cynical, but that's the way I feel about it, particularly now. You know, old habits really die hard in an industry which is not changing fast enough for its own good. Simples, quote me on it. I don't care. <laughs> I'm in trouble anyway. Anyway, excuse me. I love those whiskies, the standard bottlings, available, accessible, good price. I stockpiled a few. I went and checked my stash a few days ago. I finished them all. Never sold them. I drank them. Loved them. But I'm out looking for a Brochlady again. Because it's quite a long time since the distillery reopened. And you get the organic 2010 and you get the Barley Variety 2010, and every now and again the classic 10 year old laddie appears. Great whiskey, if you can find it. But question is, where's the 12 year old? Where's the 15 year old? Where's the 17 year old? Where's the 21 year old versions of Brook Laddie now? A decade ago, you got a thousand and one varieties in all different shapes, size, forms and permutations. And now, seriously, you're struggling to find any Brochladi at all out there. Your, safest, your best bet is to find someone who bought a private cask and has bottled it and sold some of it because you're getting a damn good whiskey. But there's so few and far between. I have a theory about this, and this, I'm going to conclude my video on this. Um, I have a theory that the owners are holding back Brochladi to be as old as possible before they bottle it to get the maximum profit yield they can. So that I think they're going to focus on the Brochladi, you don't, you basically get very, very little under 25 years of, of age. And at that point, it'll be a thousand pounds a bottle, two thousand, five thousand pounds a bottle. Hey, it's anybody's guess at the moment because we're at the brink of some serious global inflation. And in 10 years' time, you're going to look back and say, a hundred pounds for a bottle of single malt. My goodness, that was cheap. You, you, you can see if you look carefully and disregard all the media flannel. So much is going on at the moment. These are very turbulent times. And inflation has been suppressed by so long and all the money printing has got to change. There's going to be a sharp, sharp shock of about five years right across the global whiskey industry. People are going to really have to tighten their belts, but the speed of recovery is going to be swift as well due to technology, due to infrastructure organisation and due to recalibration with artificial intelligence, computerization, and organisation generally. Um, but there's going to be a pretty significant reset, recession and I believe, and it's just my opinion, only my opinion, that the owners <coughs> excuse me, of Brook Laddie are holding back the stock so after the big global dip and recession they have these really old a big big stock like Bunhaben has of really old stuff that they're going to get super high prices for because of the age because it gave the sheer age and the authenticity of that age gives them a strategic advantage on the international market over many other world whiskey makers Right, 
That's quite enough for one video. Oh, getting a bit long winded here, it's a good thing you're interested malt mates. I'm Ralphie, thank you for watching, I'll tell you, it's up to yourself, leave a comment if you want me to tell you more about my time at Bruch Laddie Whiskey Academy. I'll even get the album out, you know, I should do, um, and, and go through it because the pictures show a thousand words, you know. But hey ho, that's for another day. Thanks for watching, bye bye.